Today, we're going on a tangent. We're not gonna build anything directly for the vacuum tube computer or even the little one-bit breadboard computer that we're working on. We're just gonna kinda do something a little different. And it's no secret that I have this weird fascination with replicating modern integrated circuits with vacuum tubes. I mean, that's, that's kind of exactly what we're doing with the vacuum tube computer. We're replicating the MC14500. But that is a huge undertaking. And a little while back, I got this idea percolating in my brain and it, it just took a hold and I, I couldn't get it out of my head until I sat down and I started working on it. And what that idea was, was replicating the 555 timer integrated circuit with vacuum tubes. This is a cool one. So let's hop over to the bench, take a look at the game plan, and then let's start working on building up that vacuum tube version of the 555. All right, first, a little background. This is the 555 timer IC. It's probably the most ubiquitous integrated circuit of all time. To this day, they still sell millions and millions of these every year, and it's been around for something like 40 years. It is just a beautiful, timeless design that gets used in millions of products around the world. It is so popular, in fact, that I would go out on a limb and say that every electronics hobbyist has at least one of these in their collection. Sometimes a lot more than just one. They're super cheap, and they work wonderfully well, and they can just be used in a ton of different applications. So because this is such an important integrated circuit in the history of electronics, I thought it would be really cool to replicate it with vacuum tubes. So in order to understand kind of what we're up against, let's take a look at the internal construction of the 555. And it looks a little complicated because the lines are kind of going everywhere, but I did that so that the, the eight pins would match up to the actual packet. There's really just six primary parts to this. The first is that there's these three resistors over here on the left that go between VCC and ground. And these create a voltage divider, where at this point it's two-thirds VCC and this point is one-thirds VCC, because these three resistors are all the exact same value. And these two junctions feed into two separate comparators. Now where it gets interesting is that the non-inverting input of this comparator hooks up to one-third VCC and the inverting input of this comparator hooks up to two-thirds VCC. And then the non-inverting input of the top comparator goes to our threshold pin and the inverting input of the bottom comparator goes to the trigger pin. And then the output of these two comparators go to a set reset flip-flop. And so by controlling what is hooked up to the trigger or the threshold, we can control when either the set or the reset pin of the flip-flop goes active. And then the output of this SR flip-flop goes in two directions. Well, first of all, it comes off of the inverted output. And then one direction is to the output pin. And usually it goes through a inverting uh, buffer before it goes to this output pin. But the other direction is the really interesting one because it goes into a transistor. And one leg of that transistor is connected to ground and the other is connected all the way over to our discharge pin. And what this means is that we can have, for example, a capacitor with a certain amount of stored charge hooked up to the discharge pin. And whenever the SR flip-flop switches and enables this transistor, it allows that capacitor to discharge through the discharge pin to ground. And this is an extremely important part of making oscillators and a lot of the really interesting things that a 555 timer can do. And then finally, we have a reset pin over here in the bottom right. And that reset pin essentially just sets our set reset flip-flop to zero. It just resets it for us. Now, the only pin that isn't really all that important is the control pin up here. And it connects up directly to this two-thirds VCC spot here. But for most situations, it's not used. So there's a lot of really great information out there about the 555. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about how exactly this works. But the important thing are those fundamental components that we were talking about. And creating a resistor divider is pretty easy. That's just resistors. The comparators here, well, an operational amplifier can actually operate as a comparator when it's in open loop form. And it just so happens that in a previous episode, we've built an operational amplifier. As a matter of fact, we, uh, we built two of them. <laughs> and here is the schematic for the operational amplifiers that we built. And they're pretty simple. It's just a long-tailed pair on the left here with three amplifier stages and then a buffered output. And two operational amplifiers in open loop configuration will work fantastically for our two comparators here. 
Now, an SR flip-flop, that's something that we've built before as well. We built this uh, display SR flip-flop based around a multi-vibrator design a really long time ago. And here's the schematic that we use for that. And it's a really simple design. We just essentially have uh, two pentodes cross-coupled with the output of one going into the input of the other. And so if you're interested in learning more about either the operational amplifier or the SR flip-flop, be sure to check out those older videos. And the output, which is really just a buffered output, we can just use a cathode follow for that. That's really simple. So the only part of the entire 555 timer that's kind of tripping me up is this little discharge transistor here. But I have an idea on how to tackle this, and that is this design right here. So at first glance, there doesn't look like there's a whole lot of really interesting things going on here. I mean, we have our standard uh, voltage divider here for the input that comes into our control grid down here. And then our screen grid is tied high through a relatively small resistor. But where it gets interesting is instead of having our B plus voltage coming into the plate here, this is actually going to be our discharge pin. And the B plus voltage is going to be whatever's on the other side of that pin, could be a charged up capacitor. Now normally this wouldn't work well with something like a triode because you need a strong positive voltage on the plate to attract the electrons from the cathode. But as we discharge whatever's hooked up to here, well that voltage is going to steadily decrease. And as the voltage gets lower and lower and lower, the amount of attraction for those electrons gets smaller and smaller. And so it can only discharge to a certain point. But by this being a pentode, we have a strong positive voltage on the screen grid here that is creating an attraction for the electrons to fly up towards the plate, even as the plate gets weaker and weaker. So by using a pentode, we can actually misuse it to work as an alternative for the discharge transistor. Now it'll never be as good as a transistor, but we size everything else appropriately. I think we can get away with using this as our discharge. And so before we get too deep into designing the world's largest 555 timer, let's give this a real quick test. All right, I've got my little 6AU6 here set up as that discharge setup that we were looking at. And essentially the plate is acting as the discharge pin. And then coming into that discharge pin, we have a 33,000 ohm resistor. And coming out of that discharge pin, we have a capacitor that's hooked up to ground. So essentially the 33,000 ohm resistor will charge this capacitor up. And this capacitor will sit fully charged on the plate, which is what we're reading here. We're reading straight off of the plate. And you can see we're reading uh, about 20, 25 volts. As a matter of fact, my vacuum tube voltmeter here is still warming up, so we'll adjust it just a little bit. Now that it's reading a solid 24 volts, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this button to the input. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow the tube to start to conduct. And that will discharge this capacitor. So we should see the needle swing all the way down to a fairly low number. And then when I release the button, we should see that needle slowly build back up as the capacitor builds up charge. All right, so let's push that button and watch the needle and see what happens here. Yes, look at that. That went all the way down to about two volts. So we were able to discharge that capacitor very nearly to zero. That was amazing. Now when I let go of this input, we should see the needle swing back up as the capacitor slowly charges up. Yeah, look at that. So it charged up really quickly initially, but as the capacitor got more and more charge into it, it started to slow down until it ultimately got back up to 24 volts. Now we can actually test out how this would react if it were a triode by just hooking the Pinto up in triode mode. And we just do this by attaching the screen grid to the plate. So let's do that right quick. All right, now through this uh, relatively large jumper, we've got the screen grid and the plate hooked up. So when I push this button, we should see it discharge the capacitor. Yeah, it discharged, but it didn't go nearly as low. Look at that, it went down to about eight and a half volts. So when it was in pinto mode, we were going all the way down to two volts. That's really cool. So we definitely need to be running this in pinto mode. So the next step is to hop on the computer, and I spent a ton of time in DesignSpark PCB, my uh, PCB design software of choice, and I came up with this design, and I was really pretty happy with it. So let's hop out to the garage, cut a rather large circuit board, and see if we can put this thing together.
And here we go. Boom, I am quiet happy with that. It looks phenomenal. There's three rows of six tubes each for a total of 18 tubes. Now along the far left here, we have our three resistors here. And I used uh, quiet high wattage resistors. I didn't need to, but I just thought they looked cool. <laughs> And that matches with the three resistors here. And the values I chose were 4.7K for the three of these. Now the top two rows here are our two operational amplifiers. And then these two tubes here are the SR flip-flop. These two tubes here are the buffered output. And then these two tubes here on the far right are the discharge. So as an art piece, it looks amazing. It's almost got the right dimensions as the real 555 timer scaled up. And these metal legs that I cut out of just some random steel that we had in the garage look really cool. So it looks phenomenal, but what I'm really going for here is more of a functional artwork. So we need to test this thing out. Now there are four primary modes that the 555 timer can operate in. It can operate as a Schmidt trigger, as a bi-stable latch, as a mono-stable latch, and as an a-stable oscillator. So I wanna test this thing in all four of these modes. Uh, but we'll start with the easiest one, and that's gonna be the Schmidt trigger. Now, if we look at the schematic, we can see that the control pin here has a 10 nanofarad capacitor to ground, but actually on mine, I needed a pin that I could have negative 12 volts coming in. And so I got rid of the control pin altogether, and that's now my negative 12 volt bias pin. So let's give this a shot. All right, it's a little precarious having it set up like this because I have to just use alligator clips to attach everything. I really need to think about maybe making a socket for this in the future. Uh, but anyways, for now, we've got our Schmidt trigger set up here. For R1 and R2, I'm just using 33,000 ohms. And for my input is this potentiometer here that's connected to 24 volts and ground. And the center pin of that potentiometer is hooked up to both pins two and six, which are connected together through this uh, jumper cable here. And then the oscilloscope here is reading both off of the center pin, which is going to be our input, and off of pin number three from our very large 555 here, which is the output. And so the yellow trace on here is the center pin, and the purple trace here is the output. And you can see that uh, this is five volts per division, so we've got a high level output coming out. Now, as I move this potentiometer, we should see the yellow trace go up until a certain point, and at that point, the 555 should trigger, and we should see the purple trace drop low. There it goes! All right, and so what's important to note about that is the point where it triggers to go from low to high, and the point where it triggers to go from high to low are different. So this is a form of hysteresis, which means that this thing is functioning as a working Schmidt trigger. Let's see if we can get a snapshot of that. All right, so you can see that it triggers to go low all the way up to here, and then it triggers to go high all the way down to here. So this is, this is the hysteresis. So it's functioning as a Schmidt trigger. Awesome, that's one use case down. Let's set up and build the next one. All right, this time we've got it set up as a bi-stable latch. This is essentially just an SR flip-flop. And so this should absolutely work. Essentially what we're doing is we're tying the threshold to ground, and then we have the trigger and the reset pins being our set and reset pin. And so instead of having the oscilloscope set up this time, I've got a little uh, vacuum fluorescent display here to show us the output. And right now the output's low. So if we push the set button, the output should go high. Let's give that a shot. Yeah, there it went. Awesome, our little VFD is illuminated here. And then if I push the reset, it should turn off. Yes, awesome. That worked fantastically well. Now it should be noted that on the real 555, both set and reset are active low, which means that the pin is normally high and then when you pulse it low, that's when you actually set or reset the chip. Now my set does work like that, but my reset actually comes out to be as active high instead of active low. And this was just a quirk of the design. So for the uh, vacuum tube 555 here, this little bar over reset goes away. But other than that, I mean, it seems to work fantastically well as an SR uh, flip-flop which is a really terrible use of a vacuum tube 555 because you can build an SR flip-flop out of just two tubes. So to uh, use 18 tubes to do the exact same thing that these two tubes are doing is 
uh, a hilarious waste of power. <laughs> but that is one more usage case for the 555 taken care of. We've just got two more to go, so let's set up for the next one and test it out. All right, usage case number three, this is monostable mode. And so pins six and seven back here are tied together. And both of those come out to the junction between a resistor and a capacitor. And one end of the resistor is going to VCC and then the other side of the capacitor is going to ground and then they meet in the middle. And I'm using a 33,000 ohm resistor and a 22 microfarad capacitor. Now this is essentially a debounce circuit. It's a really complicated debounce circuit. Uh, but the trigger, which is active low, when I pull it low, that's going to bring our output high. And then when I release the button, the output will stay high until the discharge discharges the capacitor below one third VCC, at which point the output should turn off. So again, our output is set up as this little vacuum fluorescent display here. Let's push the button and see what happens. Yeah, look at that. So if I give the button a real quick tap, the VFD stays on for a set amount of time, however long it takes this capacitor to discharge through the two discharge tubes up here. That's working flawlessly in monostable mode. That's really cool. We can even swap the capacitor out for something huge. So that was originally a 22 microfarad. This is now a 100 microfarad. And so it should take a lot longer for this capacitor to discharge. So when I push this button, we should see the VFD stay on for a lot longer. Yeah, yeah, it's still on. Ah, there it goes, it finally discharged. So now we've got a really long pulse. That's awesome. That's working beautifully in monostable. So, so far that's three out of four. We've just got one more usage case left. So let's set up for that one and test it out. All right, this is the final usage case for a 555, and this is the one I'm most nervous about. This is a stable mode, which is an oscillator. So essentially this capacitor here is getting charged up and discharged, and we should see a square wave in relation to that. And so threshold and trigger are tied together and they go to one side of the capacitor, and then there's a resistor between them and discharge, and then another resistor between discharge and VCC. And that should create an oscillation. I've got everything hooked up except for this one little jumper. So let's plug it in and see what happens here. Yeah, look at that. Such a clean square wave coming out of it. Looks like it's at about uh, 680 hertz. So that's a pretty good square wave. I've got two potentiometers here set up so I can adjust it. I think if I adjust one of these, I'll change what the duty cycle is. But yeah, look at that, I'm changing the duty cycle. So now I've got a longer on period than off period, uh, but I can bring that right on down to near a 50% duty cycle. That's really cool. Now let's hook up another probe onto this capacitor and see if we can see the charging and discharging. <laughs> yes! Wow, look at that! Oh, that's so cool. You can see the capacitor charges up until the output changes to drop it off. And then you can see the capacitor discharging until it hits the threshold and pops back up again. That is so cool. This thing is working exactly like a 555 timer should. I cannot state how excited I am. I made a 555 timer out of vacuum tubes. How crazy is that? Only a lunatic does something like that. There's not a diode or integrated circuit anywhere on this board. It's just tubes, resistors, and capacitors. How cool is that? It is a functioning 555 timer made out of vacuum tubes. <laughs> so what's the next step? Well, there's two things that I would like to do from here. The first is I would really like to make a socket for it. Uh, hooking things up with all these uh, alligator clips is precarious and kind of a pain. So I would like to ultimately make one big socket that you can plug little circuit boards into that have the resistors and capacitors set up for the different usage cases. So that's, I think I'm gonna do that in a future video. But the other thing that I would really like to do with this is I would like to ultimately make this available as a kit. 
So trying to figure out how to make this into a somewhat affordable kit is a, an avenue that I think I would like to explore in the future. So if that's something you guys are interested in, definitely let me know in the comments and, and we'll start getting the ball rolling on trying to figure out how to do that. But for now, this is by far and away one of the coolest things I've ever built. I have a very large version of a small 555 integrated circuit and it works beautifully. I could not be happier with the way this turned out. And I just think it's the coolest thing I've ever built. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to keep playing with this, but thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.